All right, I think we're live. Um, so we have about four of y'all in your room. We want to wait maybe one more minute just to give anybody else a chance. All right, yeah. So welcome everybody. This is our Reverb webinar. Mario, which episode is this? 11? Yes, it is. This is episode 11 of the Reverb webinar series. Um, today we're going to be talking to you all about live music production. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So let me give you a little brief introduction of myself. Um, so those who you don't know me, my name is Marty Manwan. Um, currently I'm a project officer at Music TT in charge of the live music district. I've also been an audio engineer for about 15 years, um, working primarily in rock and pop. Um, I have also worked as a resident engineer in a few venues, including like 51 Degrees, Woodford Cafe, Little Carib. And um, as I've worked as an engineer for specific bands like Orange Sky, Inside Coin, um, Lynchpin. And through that, I've got to work with some huge venues, including like Gene Bear Complex, O2 Park, um, K Donna Space, Pair One, and a whole bunch more. So, um, and also, I've been a musician as a performer for. Um, more than 20 years and um, doing stuff, at least 300 shows I've done over my career. And of course, I work in production. Those who know me probably know me from working in the studio, Random Design Studios, where I produce everything from soca, pop, chutney, rock, hip hop, whatever, you know? So today we're going to be looking, oh, I forgot to mention too, I also have a, run a company with three other guys called GSD Productions. Um, we have done about 20 events so far. Um, we do maybe three to four events a year, and um, yeah, it's been to great success. We can in rock mostly and different genres too, but mostly rock. So today we're going to be looking at oh, sorry uh, live music production. So we're going to really be focusing on events with sound reinforcement um, or like that has a PA system, right? So. Uh, because there are live live events that don't necessarily have sound reinforcement, like in classical music or in a steel band um, concert, you may not have necessarily have a PA to reinforce the sound of the, the performers. Um, and it's not an anomaly to have non-sound reinforced sound. Um, electrically powered events have only been around for like 100 years, and live music has been around for like 40,000 years. So. I mean, this live music with PAs and all that only existed for a very small percentage of the time that we've been performing music. Um, I would like to encourage all of you, if you are really interested in getting into like live music and understanding all the kind of psychology and stuff behind it, the two books that I'd, I'd like you to go check out. Um, this is Your Brain on Music by uh, Daniel Laverton and The Singing Neanderthals by Steve Mithin. So, if you get a chance, Google those. They are really good books. I really highly recommend them, especially if you're thinking again into live music and live music production. Um, so in general, this talk is not going to be very technical. We're not going to be mentioning stuff like decibels and frequencies and those kinds of things. We're going to really be focusing on the a holistic view on live music production, not really into the idea of, oh, this microphone is good for this sound or this um, speaker wedge is really good at this type of event. No, we're not going to be looking at that. There are tons of courses based around that. Um, in my experience, there's no like holistic one-stop look at the kind of live music events. And so that's what we're going to try and tackle today. We're going to try and keep it as brief as possible. If I'm talking too quickly, please let me know. Um, let me just pull up the chat there. Um, and yeah, we're going to really be focus, this thing is really focused on people who want to get into live events, uh, whether you're a performer or an engineer or another technician, we're really going to be looking at this thing holistically. Um, so let's take a look at the points. So first of all, we're going to start with who are the players in this kind of live music production atmosphere. We're going to look at the skills that are involved in them, the dynamics between all the players, and then finally the do's and don'ts. in. Um, performing and producing a live music event. 
So right, these are the who's. So we're going to start, we're going to kind of break it up into teams. So we're going to look at three teams, basically, the three main teams in this, the technical team, the creative team, and the marketing team. So the technical team is the ones that are responsible for, well, as you would think, all the technical aspects of the show, mainly the stuff that happens before and during the event. Um, the creative team is the one that's responsible for all the design elements of the show and the overall concept. And then finally, the marketing team is the one responsible for letting everyone know about the show. And I mean, I always like to say it's not a show without an audience. So obviously, you need a marketing team. The, probably the most important part of this is the marketing team. So let's take a look at, first of all, let's look at the technical team. So I'm going to be using these tiny little infographics to kind of make it a little more visual for you. So a technical team is revolves around the number one person, the production manager. So the production manager is the guy who's the captain, the anchor of this team. They're the one that's kind of in charge of the execution of the event, right? Um, we're going to look at all these kind of satellite teams around the production manager or the production management team because, again, each of these could be a single individual or a team of people. Um, when we're looking at events, I mean, even from the smallest event, if it's like you performing in a bar as just singing karaoke in a bar, all of these things are essential. Probably you, the individual, is going to make up the majority of the rules in the team, but all these rules need to be played to execute the event properly. So um, first of all, we have this production manager. And after the production manager, it satellites out into stage manager, event capture, and then obviously the all the technical teams, the audio team, lighting team, costume team, and the set design team. The main thing that you need to remember is that communication between all the members of this team is essential for the event to run properly. So let's break it down and let's look at some definitions of what it means to be a production manager. So right, a production manager. For sure, they have the overall responsibility for managing all the logistics of the event. What do you mean by the logistics of the event? So um, some of the logistics of the event would include getting all the licensing in place to have the event, making sure that you have your court clearance or your fire and fire services representation or your police services or EMA clearance. So this is the role of the production manager. Usually a production manager could fall under the role of a promoter as well which happens a lot in Trinidad. So the production manager tends to be the promoter or the promoter will have a production manager on his team. Right, so the first step of a production manager is making sure that all the logistics for the event are taken care of. So um, after the creative team does its work and conceptualizes everything, production manager now has to think, all right, what are the needs for my um, event to happen? After that, they need to assemble the team, the technical staff for the team. Then they will have to attend all the meetings for all the artists, all the specialists, and all the staff to make sure the artist direction of the event is um, represented properly. Uh, they have to know, once all of that is taken care of, they have to get a strict budget and operate within that budget. I don't know how much times I tell people this. So the budget is the blood of the event. I mean, and your production manager is the guy that kind of makes sure that everybody sticks to this budget. Um, also, the production manager is the one responsible for health and safety legislation and making sure that's closely followed. And then also, obviously, dealing with any problems that might arise and liaison closely with the stage management team. Um, so some of these skills that a production manager has to do. Communication. So the production manager, his number one skill is communication. Um, disaster management, also a prerequisite for a production manager. Um, because we all know Murphy, I don't know if you all know about Murphy's law, that anything bad will happen, will end up happening at your event, is always present. So disaster management is a key, key function of a production manager. And a production manager should also be very well networked and also have very good financial management and negotiation skills. Um, production manager also has the most amount of work to do before an event begins. Um, so during the event, there's not a lot of heavy work and a lot of heavy lifting, but all the pre-stuff is the production manager's responsibility. So let's look at the guy that's right under the production manager or the production management team. It's the stage manager. 
So the stage manager doesn't have a lot of work to do before the event, but the execution of the event is where the stage manager kind of comes into his own. Um, they control all the aspects of the live performance. So everything that everybody has to communicate with the stage manager generally, and the stage manager has to tell everybody what they have to do. So he's the boss once the event begins, right? They ensure everything runs smoothly and on time. Um, if we go back there, you can see when I had the, the, it, the um, icon for stage management is a little clock. And I mean, that's kind of what a stage manager does, maintains everybody on time. Um, usually they work alongside like stage hands and runners, um, and they may have an assistant sometimes. Um, they are responsible for attending rehearsals and sound checks to make sure everything's run on time, time and everything, making sure everything goes well. And then they ensure that queues happen on time. So usually the stage manager is the one that calls the queues for everybody else in the performance, all the rest of the technical team. Right, so let's look at all the parts of the technical team now. So we're gonna start with audio, because I mean, that's where I'm from. So I'll probably go into that in any most detail. And the others we'll just discuss as much as I know about it. So the audio team. All right, and as we're discussing these, technical teams, you're going to see some stuff highlighted in green. Those, these things highlighted in green are people that are, yes, part of the technical team, but also part of the creative team. I could more argue that the creativity side is very, is kind of more essential to what they do, but they have to be also part of the technical team. Sorry, excuse me. So right, this is the audio team. We have the audio designer. We have the front of house engineer. We have the monitor engineer. Uh, we have the system engineer, and then we have all the audio technicians. So let's break this down real briefly. Um, the audio designer is responsible for pre-planning and audio setup and execution for the events, right? The skills would include, obviously, audio engineering, acoustics, um, but they will also need stuff like aesthetic design, creative imagination, and, of course, communication. Everybody, I'm going to probably say communication, right? So think about the audio designer as the guy who decides what the sound is going to sound like for the event, what it's going to look like for where the speakers are set up, what is going to, um, how we're going to set up monitoring for all the people on the stage, how each person is going to represent their role on, on his team. So he'll decide, all right, the audio mixing console needs to be here, the front of house mixing console needs to be here, so on and so forth. Then we have the front of house engineer. So let's break that down real briefly. The front of house engineer does exactly that. He represents and mixes the music for the audience, for everybody to hear, right? He should not be dealing with, with the audio for the performers to hear. The front of house engineer deals with the audio for the audience to hear, right? Um, the skills include audio engineering, of course, uh, observation, and they need to have a very highly trained ear to know if something is going wrong and how to adjust those things really quickly. Obviously, they need to have fast reflexes and be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Very passionate about what they do, but also very um, compassionate on dealing with issues, right? Try not to be buffing up your artists because you know they do like them kind of thing, right? Um, then we have the monitor engineer. So a monitor engineer does that. He mixes and controls the music specifically for the performers to hear, right? Again, they need audio engineering skills, communication, and observation. And of course, they need empathy, again, for your performers and some um, patience because, you know, it's not the easiest to deal with live performance, right? Um, the system engineer is the one that's responsible for setting up and maintaining the public address system. So usually they would be um, external to the event, but they, they could be internal to the event depending on the event, if they own the sound system. But usually um, for live events, a sound system is rented or a company would provide the sound system. So the system engineer is usually a, a highly trained engineer with a lot of experience who is responsible for setting up and maintaining that sound system. Not necessarily somebody directly on your payroll for the event, but a supplier for your event, right? Again, they need a specific set of skills, communication being a key one, but usually a systems engineer should be an electrician, have a wireman license to be able to accurately represent what's going on with the sound system, right? 
system engineer sometimes is responsible for power at the event. So like would supply a um, generator or get power directly from the venue. So they're the ones that would know the power requirements and these kinds of things for the sound system. And then finally, the audio technicians, those are the ones that are responsible for assisting all the members of this team. Um, they will be plugging in the cables, checking the microphones, and doing all these sorts of things. Again, audio engineering and communication, key skills, but they should also have a high sense of endurance and strength because they are the ones usually lifting all the cables, lifting all the speaker boxes, and setting up everything, right? So if you're thinking of getting into audio, you're going to probably start from that audio technician stage. You need to have a little flash on your boots, right? All right, let's go next to the lighting team. So again, remember those ones in green are also part of the um, creative team. We're going to talk about the creative team in a little bit. But yeah, so we're going to start with that light and designer. So they're responsible for pre-planning and of, of, of the event and the light setup and execution. And in case of production, the light and designer is also responsible for incorporating all those aspects into the show. Right? Uh, their skills would definitely include stuff like drafting because they have to draw up a light plot to be able to tell the operators where lights need to be placed. They need to have, obviously, light and design skills, communication, and obviously a keen sense of imagination and creativity because they're the ones determining the look of the show, where lights are going, how it's going to be distributed, um, what kind of light and effects are going to be for different things, and so on. Um, next, we go to the operator. These are, or the programmer, they implement the design of the designer. Um, their skills will obviously include stuff like electrical engineering because they have to know how to distribute electricity across all the lights, um, communication again, problem solving, and of course they will need to know stuff like DMX programming, which is like the lighting code and lighting language. So they need to know about how, how to do all these things. Um, obviously you're going to need electricians on your lighting team, and they will be responsible for ensuring the power capacity is properly distributed. Um, again, you need to be an electrician to be an electrician, right? <laughs> and of obviously you need to do communication. And then finally, your, your lowest tier on the lighting team would be the lighting technicians. And again, responsible for helping out the entire team. They're the ones that do all the heavy lifting, um, focusing the lights to where they need to be. They're the ones that are gonna probably have to climb the ladders so they can't be afraid of heights, you know? Um, so yeah. That's your lighting team. Um, sometimes what people do is put stuff like special effects and pyrotechnics in your lighting team. Um, so it can be. I like to think of it as part of the stage team or the set team because they have to rig it onto parts of the stage and mark off parts of the stage that um, certain special effects are going to be taking place in. So we're going to talk about them when we reach the set team, which I think is not next now. So we're going to talk about costuming. So costuming is very is a little more specific. Not every live event you're going to have a costume designer and tailors, but if you're working in theater, musical theater specifically, you're going to have a costume designer. I mean, even at some of the big events like Suka Monarch and stuff, a lot of the uh, performers work with their own costume designer and tailors. So if something happens, if they rip something on the, on the clothes, it can be repaired quickly. And then a designer will tell them, okay, we need what needs to be done. And of course, the designer is the one who's going to create the look for the performer. Um, and they usually will have to be at the event to make sure the look is executed properly. Um, the tailors are the ones that are going to probably dress the performer and repair anything that happens. Um, again, very specific, very large events, you'll see a costume designer or like for theater productions. But there's no reason you shouldn't incorporate costume design into your performance. I mean, even if you're performing, again, in the bar singing karaoke, yes, I would say you can be your own costume designer. Design an outfit, your performer, you're going to entertain. So make it part of, of your show. And then finally, we're going to talk about the set design. Um, so the set design is the one responsible for the look of the event and of the venue. Um, the set designer is the one that's going to conceptualize these things based on his interaction with the other persons in the creative design team. Um, 
So they again, the one in charge, they will do all the design, some skills they would need, uh, obviously um, a bit of architecture skills, a bit of creativity, and um, obviously communication. Um, right now the set designer will be the prop manager. Again, a prop manager is more for theater style events, but again, they're responsible for sourcing and maintaining any required props for the event. So props could be from, if you've ever been to like a Dimash Gras show, you might see they might walk on stage with like cardboard cutouts of things, you know, or it could be all kinds of stuff. Um, and then obviously after that, as I was talking about before, is the pyrotechnicians. These are the ones responsible for like special effects, fireworks, smog, smoke machines, those kinds of things. And then finally the carpenters, which are the ones responsible for building all these things, making sure all these things are set up properly and working, right? And then the final stage of your live, final team of your live events is your event capture, right? So right, your event capture. So modern events should not be existing without event capture. Again, even if you're singing karaoke in a bar, you should have somebody there for doing photography, doing video capture, and even live streaming if necessary. You know, content is king in this day and age. It's not only about your live performance, but about all the stuff that can happen after your live performance, right? So obviously you need these three people, a photographer, um, you don't need it, but a recording engineer for the audio recording, and then a film crew or a streaming crew or both, right? And obviously streaming is a way to increase your audience and the photography and the recording audio is a way to have post event promotion. So it can promote your next event or it can promote the, your current event. So let's get into the creative team. So the creative team is headed by the creative director, right? So the creative director is usually the brains behind the event, sometimes as part of the promoter team. Um, they usually conceptualize the entire event, hires all the other teams. They're responsible for all the intellectual property for the event. And they usually work hand in hand with the promoter slash the marketing team to ensure the vision is properly communicated. The director, all the creative director also must communicate the ideas to all the persons, the, the four designers that we discussed above, right? So the audio designer, lighting designer, costume designer, and set designer. So that creative director is the one that um, communicates his vision to all these people, and all these people then now help him with his vision. So the other people on this design team that we haven't spoke about is the artist or the musical director in some cases, right? So again, this depends on the type of event. Um, a straight up concert might just have multiple artists and may not have a musical director, um, but unless it's a house band, if it's a house band, you may have a musical director being part of the house band. Um, so whether it's a musical director or artist, this person is responsible or people are responsible for creating and interpreting the performance of the music for the event directly. And if they're the performers themselves, indirectly via the group. Um, or whether if they want to use live musicians or pre-recorded music, all these kind of things happen from the musical director artist side, right? In terms of artists, they are the talent um, and they're the majority of the production element. All the other elements that we've spoken about so far have to support these performers, okay? Um, and it's a very strange thing in live music production. It's kind of one of the only things that your audience, your resources, and your staff are all humans, you know, because all your resources are all these humans we spoke about. Your audience is the actual audience, and technically your customers are your performers, you know? So everybody is, it's all humans, so what's the most important thing for humans is communication, right? So again, we're gonna reiterate communication as we keep going through. And then finally, we're gonna talk about this marketing team, right? So the marketing team is very essential for the production, right? Um, usually the marketing team is made up of a promoter, right? And a committee, right? For most events, it's a promoter and a committee, right? Um, marketing is kind of, without marketing, you can't have a show because without an audience, you can't have a show, right? And marketing is responsible for having your audience get into there. Um, they are responsible for communicating to the audience about the event. Again, persons attend. And usually it involves like marketing experts and um, a committee of well networked people, right? 
Um, again, you could ask me some questions about marketing when we reach it, but it's, it's just brief. It's kind of understood what marketing is about, right? So finally, we're going to talk about the communication that an artist should do with all these teams and what's the mechanisms about going through this, right? So yeah, artist communication. This can make or break your event, right? So the artist is the one, again, they're the customer for your live event. Or if you are the artist themselves, you're the talent for the event, right? Um, how you communicate with your team can um, be the difference between having the greatest performance of your life and having a complete disaster and meltdown on stage. Um, like the human body, a live event has many, many moving parts and smooth communication between these parts is essential for keeping it running, right? Um, you also have to remember as the artist, you are the customer, but you are not the consumer, okay? So yes, you are, be, you are performing and all these other elements of the teams are there to support you, but you're not the one consuming it. So if you're having a bad time on stage, that's not the time to be, hey, engineer, what you doing? Da, 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 da. Remember, people are still out there trying to consume what you are doing as an artist. So professionalism has to remain in a more priority when you're on stage and execution of what you're doing. Even if you're having technical troubles on stage, you have to try and push through it and get it done, you know? So let's look at the do's and don'ts for this artist communication. Right, so we're gonna start with the nice positives, what you should do, right? So the first thing you should do as a performer, again, big or small event, doesn't matter, get your technical writer prepared, right? Prepare it in advance. Don't wait till the day of the event or the day before the event to prepare your technical writer. If you do that, I'm pretty much sure you're gonna run into problems when you show up for your sound check or you show up for your performance, right? Get that as soon as you're booked for the event, that's when you should send your technical writer to the production manager, right? It'll save you tons of headaches. And if you have problems um, knowing how to prepare a technical writer, what one should look like, we recently put up a ton of documents on the Music TT's um, resources page. And we also have a link directly where you can go to a site that helps you build your technical writer from scratch. Um, so yeah, make sure to prepare that technical writer. That's the first, first, first thing you need to do. Um, next thing, once you show up to your sound check or you show up to a pre-production meeting, make sure to network with everybody. Introduce yourself to every single individual on that team. Learn their names on a first name basis. That's going to save you so much trouble, right? This will create a real sense of community for the event. Everybody will now feel like they have a stake in the event and a stake in, in making your performance be the best it can be. Um, and the camaraderie that it'll create will just kind of, it'll just make everything easier and make everything better. And if you have problems, people will be much quicker to rush to help you than, you know, hope, hope that you can solve it yourself. So yeah, make sure network, meet everybody from the production manager to the electrician. Make sure meet every single person and that's part of that team. Um, next thing that you should do, be very, very clear with your instructions, articulate, your needs very, very clearly when you're in sound check or when you're on stage. Make sure it's very clear um, without hampering your performance, right? If you think, if you're on stage and you do and you think, oh man, I'm not hearing the music loud enough in my monitor, don't stand up there and grumble to other people that perform with you. Say, excuse me, Jeff, because you've met Jeff before, part of the network. And, hey, Jeff, I, I can really not hear the music properly in this left monitor. Do you mind if you, you could just turn it up? Um, if you, if you think it's too loud, let's just turn it up and see, and, and I really guarantee it's going to make you perform better. And it, you'll see the world of difference it'll make. Just once you did the meeting and once you're clear with what you need, and again, you should be clear what you need. Don't just say, I can't hear myself. Just say, I, I, need, to hear, I need to hear my voice more in monitor left. Just be very clear and very articulate, and you'll see it'll just be so much better, so much easier. And then finally, Make sure and go to your sound check, okay? So many times I've done events, um, and the rest of my boys in GST will will articulate this. We do events and everybody, okay, call time is this time for sound check, show up and do your sound check, and then leave. How many times the day of the sound check, your call time reach, you call any promoter, hey, I really can't make sound check today, you know, um, so I'm gonna just come and play the show. 
what do you think is going to happen when you just come and play the show? It's probably going to be a disaster, okay? So make sure and show up to soundcheck. Even if you are not scheduled on those big, big, big shows with 30 artists performing, you may not be scheduled to take part in the soundcheck. The bigger artists might be there, but you should still go to the soundcheck, right? Go to the soundcheck and go all the technical rehearsal and observe, talk to people, ask questions. It's like, hey, I noticed that um, those side side monitors are not working properly. Tell them, it's like, when I'm performing, I'd like if that could happen. And I'm sure the team will be happy for those kind of things. The engineers like to be told, like to be clear on the instructions they need to be given. They don't want to, you coming up on stage, I want to guess, oh, I don't know what I, that artist wants in his monitors, you know. I don't know if you need drums, I don't know if you need vocals. And they'll end up just giving you whatever they want. Just tell them from beforehand, even if you're not in the soundtrack, right? All right, finally, we're going to look at the don'ts, right? And this is, I would say, the most important part. And again, this is for you artists, not necessarily the performers, right? So we're going to start in the purple, right? So first thing, do not change your settings or your, pro pro or your position from your technical rehearsal. This is like the biggest thing I always see. And I mean, yes, you feel like, you know, if I tune up my guitar amp a little more, or if I cup the mic a little more while I'm performing, it's not going to cause any harm. It might not cause any harm, but it's going to cause the show to be not as good, right? And is the discipline as performers that we need you, the, we need to have them, you have to be disciplined. You go into soundcheck, perform exactly like you would at the show. Give it all, give it all, the engineer will have a better understanding of what you need. And you know what? And shows with pyrotechnics, what's happened? People is perform, and I mean, in soundcheck you do one thing, and then you come to the show, what's happened? You might step in a line of a, of a firework, or and it could get burned up, and you could die. So make sure, do exactly what you're gonna do in soundcheck, do it, uh, sorry, do exactly what you're gonna do live, make sure and do it in soundcheck. Tell everybody, okay, these are the points I'm gonna hit, this is the level my um, instrument is gonna be, this is how I'm holding the microphone, Right, so don't change things from your sound check to your live performance. Okay. Um, number two, don't be a diva. Right. Yes, you are the artist, and the audience is there to consume what you are doing, and it's your art and all these kinds of things. But accommodating the technical team will ensure that your art is better, better, better translated to the audience. Okay. Don't go up on stage and say. Do your thing and don't talk to nobody and talking to nobody or don't come up on stage and sing quiet like a mouse because, oh, I'm saving my voice for my performance later. All that's going to do is harm your performance later, right? Don't be a diva. Communicate with everybody. Make sure that you can do the best for your performance. So the only way you can do that is by communicating with everybody and thinking about this as a team. It's not me on top and everybody had to do what I say, right? Everybody's a team, everybody's trying to make the performance, and everybody's trying to translate that art to the audience. Okay, speaking of audience, don't ignore the audience as the next one. Many, many times, the artists will come up on stage and feel like they're perform performing just for themselves. They're not looking nobody in the eye, they're back to the audience, they're standing up in a position, quiet, 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 and just coming there to sing. This is not the point of being a performer. You are a performing artist, okay? You're not just an artist, you're a performing artist, okay? You are there to perform. Maybe your music might not require you to dance and jump up and down and wave a flag, but you need to be engaging to your audience, however that is. If, if you can stand up in a, in a position, and I've seen it, stand up in a position and draw that audience in, great, but just make sure you are drawing that audience in, okay? Another thing, and this is, this is key, because uh, I'm a promoter and I know how it is. Yes, that's the promoter's job to promote the event. But how much better you would think, I have a cast of 20 artists on my event, right? How much better you think the event would go if each of those artists of that of those 20 artists bring five friends to the event? Hmm? It'd be so much better. So don't forget to promote the event, right? The best part of being a performer, in my opinion, and again, this is just me, and I'm I'm pretty sure some of you will agree, the best part of being a performer is performing for an audience, right? And getting that audience feedback, that energy, right? I'm sure you don't want to go on stage and you're performing to five people and the bartender, right? So you can do your part and promote as well. Um, another don't is don't dismiss the technical team, right? So a lot of people on our technical team 
probably started off just like you, wanting to be an artist, wanting to be a singer, wanting to be a performer, right? So the advice they're giving you is not just, oh, they're trying to make their job easier and they don't want to do too much work. They don't want to have to do these things. They want your performance to be good. If you look good, they look good, okay? So they're not telling you things to because they don't feel like getting up and, and um, fixing something. They're telling you things to make sure that the show is a success and the show looks, sounds, and feels amazing, right? And then finally, don't doubt yourself, right? So a lot of performers have that sense of doubt when they go on stage, and it's very, very visible from the audience, right? Um, if you think something doesn't sound right or look right on your on stage, speak up. Don't don't just stand up there and be like, um, well, whatever. Next next time I'll get it right. Okay. Remember, it's your art you're trying to pr produce and promote, and um, it's your brand that's being represented. So you need to speak up. Right. You don't have to belittle anybody to speak up, but you have to speak up. All right. Okay. And that's kind of about it. Um, let's go to some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? I can see. Um... All right, so yes, you're asking if, what to do if, Sorry, what to do if somebody, if you're not, okay, can you recommend sound levels for live events? What are some events uncomfortably loud against? Are there balance issues? Festival. Right, so are there balance issues between front of house and stage mountain? Yeah, so, um, so sound levels for live events, yeah. I mean, those who have come to my events would know that I keep the music at a level that's conversational, right? So conversational, so while the music is playing, people should be able to stand up in the audience and not have to bawl and scream to tell their partner they're going to the bathroom. Um, it is it is pretty hard, especially in our current carnival landscape where the levels are, it's, it is too loud. Um, EMA has legal levels, 85 decibels for what an event should be like, which is not very loud. Um, it's that's about as loud as say um, a party in a little boardroom. You know, it's not very loud, but um, there are ways. And the better events, you will notice that the sound is properly distributed and it's not too loud. But DJs and some artists do like the music way louder than it should be, which is unfortunate. Um, and yeah. Are there balance issues between front and house and stage mounting? Yes, for sure. I have been to events where the band is sound checking and you think it's a large PA happening. I mean, I won't call names for, for the types of artists that do this, but where the stage volume is louder than the, the um, PA, which is kind of crazy. Um, and when they turn on the, the main house, all you notice is, oh, wait, oh, there's some bass comes in. They didn't realize that all the speakers are now on. Um, it is a discipline thing in Trinidad. Um, we can have events outside of Trinidad. I realize that that has not been a problem. But here, we, we like things loud. I mean, what else are going to say? That's what it is. People like it loud. So I have to file a copyright organization if I'm having a live music event? Yeah. Um, all right. So we come to Aaron's question after. So as, as we were saying um, before, the production team, the production management has to get all these licenses. So the question asked was, do you have to file copyright, uh, get a copyright thing for your event as a promoter? Um, yeah, you, you definitely need to. If you have persons performing at your event, you got to tell the copyright organizations, hey, these people perform, these are the material that was performed. So here is a collection of royalties so that these artists can be paid for their intellectual property, you know? All right, let's take a look at Aaron's question. What is the recoil associated with the possibility of a promoter refusing to provide someone vital to your performance? Promoter refusing to provide something vital to your performance. Right, um, contracts. You need to have your contracts before you, you, you agree to do a performance. You can't go to up to, I mean, we do 
my company does small events in little tiny clubs that hold 200 people and we still issue contracts to each performer because i mean that's the right way to do things and any contract should lay out all the technical things we always ask and all promoters should always ask for a technical rider and a hospitality rider for your performers right your hospitality rider is the stuff that the stuff that's not technical so like i need bottled water on stage um i would like a dressing area where i can spend 30 minutes before the show to get um ready um so if if you go to an event and you've signed a contract Satan, these are the things that you need and you show up you should have gotten your down payment as well and you show up and they don't have those things you you they are in breach of contract you're supposed to take your money and leave all right lisa says no we don't like it loud yeah i know we don't like it loud i don't like it loud and that's for sure but they have people that like it loud for some reason specifically like the djs and the artists that have been performing whole season and probably have a bit of hearing loss um and it is always a it's a battle so because artist x was on stage and his volume was real loud the headline artist nada headline artist the artist performed before me can't be louder than me so it had to turn up i had to be louder than him and it just kind of snowballed so by the end of the night all you hear in these speakers is a set of distorted noise and nobody's really enjoying themselves everybody has been intoxicated and it's fat as fat you know um any other questions and i mean anything you'll have to ask you can always reach out directly to us at music tt um again our music tt resources page is really really great it has a lot of stuff associated with live events. Um, I wonder, could I do a screen share here, Mariella, and show them one of these things? All right, let me see if I can get it really quickly. Um, yeah, and a replay of this will be on Music TT's YouTube page. So let me try and pull up this resources page. Make some comments on marketing. All right, so marketing, again, it is the key essential part to this thing. Um, too many times people try to throw events and they don't think about how to market the event. You know, They don't think about an audience. They just think about the performers, which is great to think about the performers, but how do I share the screen, Marilla? Okay, yeah, I've seen it. All right, I'll do it after. Um, yeah, so too many times it's always about the performers um the committee so they throw in an event but you perform on your committee which is great you know you will get some people at the event but you have to really think about your audience audience in conceptualizing event audience thoughts have to come first um i'm not a marketing expert by any means usually when i have events i hire a marketing team that helps me execute it a creative director will have the vision and the marketing team will have the vision for the marketing, right? Um, you just need to know what's the trends. I mean, in Trinidad, we're not gonna throw uh, a concert playing um, Native American music and expect 4,000 people to show up, right? Because it's unrealistic. That's not the audience. We don't have the audience for that down here. That doesn't mean you can't do a Native American music concert. You probably will have people that's interested in that and you will have an audience, but you just need to know the scope of your marketing, the scope of the event, how how to tap into that market. You know, that's why the committee is essential for marketing event. Committee are, are people like social media influencers, like they like to call them, people with the 10,000 followers on Instagram, who all you got to do is um, either give them a cut for each ticket that they sold, give them complimentary to the event, however, however you decide on, on your relationship. All right, so I want to just show you all um, a quick look at a technical rider. So I'm going to just share screen, your entire screen, share, yeah. So this is um, this is our resource that's directly on our page, and this is how to, you just create a technical rider directly from here. So you got drums, you put up your drum kit, you got your guitars, amps, you put them up. And as you put things up, you tell them what microphone you want. If you need effects, which side of the stage, you can name it. So this is Jeff. 
right? You can put where your piano is going to be. And then you can put, um, finally put where the vocals are going to be. And then you're going to put where you want your sound wedges. All right, and then once you create this, and you can, again, go through and label all these things, and you can save this and export it directly to stuff. You get a channel list. This is what you're going to forward to your technical team. And any other info that you need to put down here, you put it directly here, and you can attach a hospitality writer directly to that. My screen is not showing. Uh, turn on screen share. What's going on? Application window to share. Okay, I guess the screen sharing is now working. We just go check it out. All right, I'm sorry. Um, okay, what if your marketing shows that the target is not who you expected your audience to be? Well, that's great. I mean, if while you're doing your market research, I'm assuming Indra means after the event shows that your target is not who you expected the audience to be. Right, so whether it's before or after the event, um, and you've been doing your market research, and it shows that, oh, maybe I should not have been just happening into like young adults who are into hip hop music from my event. When I did my market research, it showed that people in their 40s who like jazz have been coming have showed up at my event. I mean, that's great. That means you have a whole new market. I mean, it doesn't mean you ignore your current market, but you should definitely figure out ways to engage your other market, this new market, this new potential market, you know? Um, Aaron says, I can only speak for myself, but I've been in scenarios where you get to sound check and something like the drum rise is too small or packed with equipment not relevant to drums, which creates a scenario where it's too small for your additional equipment at the time of your performance. Yeah, so, I mean, I've seen situations like this happen where, um, as, and it's happened to me as a promoter, where I contact a sound company to, do, to provide services for me, and I send them what my requirements are, and then I show up to the event, and they are not what I need. The drum riders, again, like the drum riser is too small or too tall in some cases. I don't have enough lines to run on my monitors or something like that. I mean, if you sign the contract, and um, you have to decide, is the performance more important to you than the money? Or is your execution of your performance more important? You have to decide if, if you've gotten your down payment, um, but you can't fulfill these services because they have neglected on something. Technically, you can tell them you need to be um, paid in full before you paid in full before you do, you do your performance, but if you don't agree with the situation that's happening there and you've sent a technical rider, they have, again, not done their contract, not unfulfilled their contract, so you are entitled to your payment. Um, okay, Lisa, can you give the idea of budget for marketing versus production management of the event in the ballpark from 200 person event to a Marshall Kess on your office concert? So um, it depends. I'll, I'll say to Lisa that depends. So she, she's asking for what the budget for marketing is versus the production management budget. So um, in general, for a 200 person event, production management is gonna cost you any ballpark of $10,000, right? Because the production management team shouldn't be more than three people, including a stage manager, a production manager, and an assistant. Um, and depending on the nature of the event, Specifically, if it's just like a concert with multiple performers, it's not a lot of pre-work that has to be in it. Just attending rehearsals <coughs> and ensuring all the licensing licenses are in place. Um, again, a 200-person event, your marketing budget is not going to be that big because a 200-person event, to me, indicates a type of niche marketing, or if it's not niche marketing, a small venue. So capacity, capacity might be a barrier there. So if, if capacity is a barrier and you think you're only going to get 200 people at the event and you've, again, gotten a venue that can hold that, that audience, then great, your marketing budget, again, I would say organic marketing might be your best bet in a situation like that, organizing interviews, um, 
again, doing all your marketing material. I mean, generally, preparing marketing material for an event might not be more than $5,000 for a 200 person event. And I mean, if you have friends in it, specifically an event for 200 people seems more like um, it's a friends and family style event. You get your friends to help you develop your marketing material and distribute it. Um, for an event like Marshall or Kess on the Rocks event, again, this now depends on your sponsorship, right? Because sponsorship is where these things kind of come into play for marketing, especially. Um, a Marshall Monday type event, again, sponsored by uh, Caribbean Airlines, traditionally Caribbean Airlines. I do not know how much he spent on it, but I'm sure it's in excess of a million dollars creating that marketing campaign and distributing that marketing campaign. Um, you could not listen to the radio without hearing that Marshall Caribbean Airlines jingle. And I'm sure everybody will agree. And I'm so fed up with that jingle. I still hear it up to today, right? Um, but yeah, just buying all that media just to play that music could, was probably in excess of $300,000. And then creating it was a ton of money too. You know, in terms of how I would make it in terms of percentages, it depends on your event again. Um, for a large event, marketing is going to probably take up the majority of the cost of your budget because it's going to be dependent on numbers being in the door. And something like a Marshall Monday, you know you're going to get 15, 20,000 people at the event, regardless of how much marketing is done. But it's to try and get those extra people at the event and to get people to be interested in your packages because all these things sell experiences. So packages like this VIP all inclusive or backstage access. These are the kind of things that are marketed to the to people and where the promoter or the artist can make the majority of their money, right? The general audience is not gonna be creating a ton of cash because that, that kind of pays for the event and that kind of special service, that VIP service is what kind of counts as profit. That's how I look at it anyway. All right. Um, any other questions? I'm going to try one more time to share, share screen. Share. Why is it not working? Choose what you would like to share. I would like to share this window. OK, it looks like the screen sharing is not working. Webinar Jam has just like upgraded some stuff so we have to like we only realized today they said oh wait you know, you need to upgrade your page although i checked it yesterday so screen sharing is not working but please um i'm going to just type the website in the um comments here so that you can access it yeah so i'm just going to copy this here in the chat so Make sure and check out this page, musictt.co.tt slash musictt slash musictt dash resources. All right. Um, so again, I'm going to just type my email for those who need to get it as well. So if you have any further questions, feel free to email me. And yeah, thanks for coming out. Um, again, check out that Music TT page. And if you need to watch this webinar again, it's going to be on YouTube from tomorrow, probably. I'm going to get try to get this up tomorrow. Okay. Thank you.